Welcome to The Real News. I'm Eddie Conway, coming to you from Baltimore. In 1975, a French philosopher analyzed the prisons as an authoritarian institution based on dominance, violence, and control. Scandal after scandal from violence between guards and prisoners, unsanitary and toxic conditions, and prison overcrowdedness. The prison system in the United States is constantly trying to re-legitimize itself through reform measures that change the dynamics of incarceration in name only, not in practice. For example, the New York City Council proposed to create better and more humane prisons to replace the notorious Rutgers Island prison. To discuss alternatives to incarceration and what a world without prisons look like, we are joined by two guests, Shelley Davis Roberts and Brandy Mack. Shelley Davis Roberts is an architectural associate at Designing Justice and Designing Spaces, a visual artist and a former San Francisco chapter president of the National Organization of Minority Architects and joins us today from Oakland, California. Brandy Mack is the community liaison at Designing Justice and Designing Spaces, as well as a holistic health educator and motivational speaker, and joins us today from Detroit, Michigan. Thank you for joining me today. Let's start with the problem. The U.S. prison system houses one-fourth of the world's prison populations. We know that it is grossly inadequate and the criminal justice system incarcerates more people of color in the United States than any other populations. Uh, we know from the beginning, the system uh, on the ground uh, has contact and arrests more people of color. We know that they go into the prison system and fail to get bail, lose their jobs, et cetera. We know that they fail to get adequate uh, legal defense and have to rely on public defenders. We know that once they're in front of judges, they don't receive fair and equal treatment. Uh, once they're incarcerated, they get more time. Uh, when they go up for parole, they uh, deny it over and over again. And when they're released, there's no wraparound service that really takes care of them, and they end up back in the prison system. So we know all that, and we know it not just from experience, but we know it from Michelle Alexandra's book, uh, Mass Incarceration, The New Jim Crow. And since that book, politicians and prison officials have been advocating prison reform, how to build more humane prisons. And that's the trend that we've, we face now in the 21st century. And so my question is, can prison reform and more humane prisons actually address the problems of the prison industrial complex? So design justice, design spaces, are the, we are abolitionists of the prison system. You know, we don't spend time thinking about how to build prettier boxes for black and brown folks to, to be housed in. Um, you know, what we believe is that uh, when, starting at the community level, you know, when communities are resourced, and meaning that they have access to education, they have access to jobs, uh, health care, you know, all the things that are really basic human rights, housing, uh, all those things that with that when you don't have them lead to crime and to violence. And so those are the things that we need to be investing in uh, in the community is to make sure that people have access to those things. And I think what people don't realize is actually the huge disparities that are happening uh, 
in access to those things, when you have those things, you tend to live in a bubble and you think that everybody's living at the same standard and that's not um, what is happening. And so more uh, investment in prisons is just less investment in, in human rights. So, you know, when you continue to do that, you just continue to feed into that never ending circle of, um, of trauma and, and violence. The trauma that happens when you don't have resources, uh, that t leads to crime, that you end up in the punishment, uh, the punitive punishment system, you're traumatized there, and then you're let back out, right back into a lack of resources. Uh, as you mentioned before, Eddie, I mean, it's just, it's a vicious cycle. And so it, it just, um, investing in, um, in, in, in prisons just is gonna continue to perpetuate that. Well, now some some of the pushback has been that officials, state officials, uh, and um, prison officials are now attempting to change the trend of where prisons are going instead of the uh, warehousing and mass incarceration. They are now talking about turning prisons into treatment programs. They're talking about building inside the prison drug treatment programs. They're talking about building mental health facility treatment programs. Uh, just recently in LA, a uh, $2 billion effort was stopped to build a treatment uh, program that would have replaced the men's jail in LA uh, uh, and turned it into a treatment center. Here in Maryland, there's a, a $400 million effort to turn the, uh, to replace the detention center with a drug treatment and mental health facility uh, ran by the uh, Department of Correction. These trends to do this is going to put people under the control of the Department of Correction. So, oh, is is there a problem with that? I'll jump in. This is Brandy. <clears throat> okay. I want to channel our beloved Michelle, who's invoked the conversation deeper for us to begin to design around it. And I also want to invoke our wonderful uh, ancestor, Harriet Tubman, who said, free or die. Mm -hmm. And what we understand is that nature does not have a design of locking anything up. And as a biomimic designer um, with the designing justice team and working with the beloved community, we understand that you can, uh, put a new skirt on something, but it doesn't change the intention um, of it causing harm. So when we talk about creating new treatment um, prisons, um, there's one big piece there that does not equate to freedom, where we are still talking about caging people and offering service um, from a level of a, using a, a colonial design of helping those poor people when we understand, um, again, when we talk about treatment, if people were resource rich, meaning the amount of community-based organizations that we have from mentorship to uh, drug um, rehabilitations, if they had the actual resources to do the work, we would not need to cage individuals with the assumption that this is what's better for them. In fact, we would be living in a more uh, reciprocity design, uh, a lifestyle where folks are met as equal. So we can put a new name on it, but again, if the design is still saying, we're gonna lock some folks up in order to make you better, when we also understand that our laws have been created, quite frankly, um, to continue the industrial system of slavery. So there's a di direct connection there. So we have to be very mindful of saying that we're gonna create a correctional treatment prison facility because there's this thing again that here you say free or die. There's still this ability to lock people up. I also just wanted to add that, um, you know, when, 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 projects like this are initiated, I mean, you, you have to ask who's in the room, 
when these kinds of decisions are being made and what kind of work has done has been done with the people who are living in these communities where these prisons are located or where the where the jails or these um, treatment uh, facilities are located you know what work is being done with the people who live around these facilities to ask you know is this really the right solution and I think there's a, a level of, of, of arrogance and, and even ignorance that, you know, I think people have because they, they don't even think to ask. There's, I think there's a notion that, oh, well, these, those people are, they're poor, they're, 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 they're violent, they're out of control, they don't know what they need. So here's what we're, here's what we're gonna do. And um, that also needs to stop. You know, there needs to be more engagement with communities to determine what are some real solutions um, that can help with with um, with these kind of issues that are happening in the communities. Again, you know, prisons exist. You know, at at this point in time, and until they are completely phased out, yes, there does need to be prison reform. But again, that is not the charge for designing justice, designing spaces, and um, we are not spending time thinking about how to improve um, prisons. But there is something to be said about, um, you know, when you say treatment treatment, and then incarceration as we know it uh, to be, uh, that just doesn't add up to a good outcome. Um, and so there really needs to be some, some rethinking and um, re-engagement um, around, that, around that idea. Mm, yeah, well, and that's 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 uh, what's happening here in Baltimore. That design is is uh, has been formulated without any input from the community. Uh, the location is in the heart of the black community, uh, and uh, the people that's going to be most impacted are people of color, and very few, if any, was around the table when when those things happen. Well, let's move though to solutions like design justice and designing space uh, has been doing this work and you've been doing work in Oakland and you've been doing work in Atlantic City. Could you talk a little bit about your work and, and how you actually uh, intend to transform the prison industrial complex into a restorative justice model? Our projects are always centered around addressing the root causes uh, of mass incarceration. So there's a focus on um, a restorative uh, justice approach, um, a holistic approach to design, and it, and it always starts with uh, community engagement. Uh, one of our projects, uh, Restore Oakland, uh, it's located in uh, Fruitvale, uh, in East Oakland. It's an 18,000 square foot facility that is um, one of the first restorative economic and restorative justice centers uh, in the country. Uh, it is home to the Ella Baker Center, uh, to uh, Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, uh, Causa Husa Just Cause. Uh, they uh, address um, housing and immigrant rights and also Restaurant Opportunities United, which um, uh, deals with equity in the restaurant interest industry and helping black and brown folks be able to uh, work in uh, front of house jobs and to be able to gain a work and gain a, a living uh, living wage income um, to be able to survive, particularly out here in the Bay Area where it is just astronomically expensive um, to live. Uh, and so it's 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 a it's a social social justice hub. And um, the way that it was designed was, was, was with community input, particularly around the, the, the restorative justice space that exists in the building. Uh, it was done uh, with the community partners uh, who were practicing uh, restorative justice. And uh, they had a, um, an important part in the design of that space. Uh, as well as the design of, of many of the spaces that are, are in the building. There's a, there's a restaurant on the ground floor uh, that uh, 
Colors restaurant and they run workforce development programs where they train and have a training kitchen. Uh, there's a, a food incubator program, La Cocina, that they're also working with. And so they're doing things to be able to uh, provide uh, um, uh, people to be able to be able to start their own businesses again to gain training and jobs so they can earn a living wage. Uh, to be able to come and there's conflict resolution that's happening. There's human rights and, and policy change that's happening there in the building. And um, I th one of the most important things is that Restore Oakland actually owns that building. So Designing Justice, Designing Spaces is also a developer. So we were able to help them to um, purchase that building and with new markets tax credits and, um, and and fundraising, they were able to construct the building. And so ownership um, in, in communities uh, like Odic Oakland, which are being gentrified, um, is is huge. And uh, so there's a, a, a multi-layer process uh, in terms of, of creating a restorative um, are starting to invest in, in restorative cities, if you if you will, um, and that and Restore Oakland is just just the start of that. Coming from the lens of working with our beloved community, doing community based organizing for the last twenty years, one thing that we recognize as uh, agents of the built environment is that we don't have a shortage of amazing programs that are looking to support our community to heal themselves from anti-blackness and racist systems. But what we do have a shortage of are the actual infrastructures for that to take place. And so we have been gracious, graciously brought on um, on the team that our mayor Keisha Bottoms has put together with our community partners who spent five years working policy um, to say, let's close down these jails uh, Women on the Rise and the Racial Justice Action Network, again, the most important part of our work is listening deep and working with community in order to make this holistic process happening. We understand that it is our work to look at the built environment. Uh, we often hear in history about redlining and all of the things that have caused um, black and brown people to be marginalized. And so as we began to reimagine that, it's not just about the building, the policy and the program are essential keys. So as Shelley asserted, we start our engagement with the folks who were most harmed by the space because who else knows better what a space of equity should look like. What I think is amazing about our project in Atlanta is that Mayor Keisha Bottoms, after listening deeply and our partners, the Racial Justice Action Network and Women on the Rise spent five years outside of the jail saying, close down these jails. This is not what's needed. And the mayor was able to listen after our partners were able to continue to say, this isn't okay. And she put together a task force of beloved community leaders throughout the city of Atlanta to say, what does it look like if we were to reimagine the Atlanta City Detention Center as a center of equity? What does that look like? And so that process, though very layered, is some of the style and the design that we have to do to undesign this environment that essentially was designed to keep us in slavery, when I say us, black and brown people. So again, we have the pedagogy and the degrees and we've created mentor programs and we continue to get grants and funding. But what does it look like, as Shelley said, to have ownership, to work in cooperation, as Africans in America at one time had Wall Streets and different communities that were intentionally burned down. So as we begin to rebuild the built environment, it's important for us to work with folks who are doing the program, but it's also a learning curve for our folks who are doing program because often we're just not taught to think about the built environment. And development is a process. Um, it can be very uncomfortable, it requires capital. It requires engaging with all of the different players, even those who may not agree with what we're doing, because the whole ecosystem has to be a part of it. But it has been an honor to work at those intersections with program, with people, um, with our city government who's saying, you know what, we do need to reimagine what it really means to create sovereignty in this nation that we call the United States. Well, well, tell me this, um, 
is it is how can other people uh, get involved and, and uh, uh, I, I can see in Oakland and Atlanta apparently there has been at least a friendly uh, city government, uh, if not friendly, at least not hostile. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how can other people in other cities get uh, involved in a process like this, uh, creating that space that will give all those wraparound services to the population and prevent them from uh, being snatched in the prison industrial complex? Uh, can, can you give us some insight or contacts or suggestions on what people might do to duplicate the process? Um, as with any new thing, um, we're excited that we've created a concept development process that you can visit our website at www.designingjustice.org and reach out to us because what we also understand is that we go fast alone, but we go far together. And again, we have amazing programs who are doing great, great work, but the built environment hasn't come into play. So we're currently working in Atlanta. We're working with Just City in Los Angeles. Um, we're tentatively working on projects in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, again, really being clear that architects, designers, and developers is what we do but also the importance of working with our community who are working in, in programs because it's an intersection. Um, we, as Shelly said, are joyous that our co-founder Kyle Rollins is working on what does it look like to have ownership? Because what we also understand is that our nonprofit model was not necessarily a regenerative model for black and brown people. Um, it can support, but is it a liberatory tool? So having a team that is versed in development to give back ownership and create cooperation is, is also a big part as we reimagine what does the world look like without prisons and what can it look like um, with the spaces that are already existing if they were resource rich. And so we're always looking for partners who are available to imagine. Uh, development is a long process. So we also say, be ready to be in it for the long haul. It's uncomfortable, but that's what anything that's good and growing is going to be uncomfortable. Um, but what's great about it is that we get to live in the lane of abolitionists. It's it's really important to be able to to feel, to feel free to, as Brandy said, to to talk to one another. That's simply the only way that it's going to happen. Is that there's there has to be a lot of cross pollination that's happening um, around around this topic. Uh, so doing the research, reaching out to each other, talking to each other. And uh, really, this process has been about transparency. Um, and the city of Atlanta has uh, recognized the process that we have done of, through community engagement by kind of building equity into the process, by reaching out to the community, building trust within the community. That has been one of the most transparent processes that they, they've had around a, a, a city project. Uh, like this, uh, we spent uh, a great amount of effort in developing tools, uh, community engagement tools that would help people to really understand what the project is about, how the design process works, what uh, are some of the things that they need to understand about the development process, um, how projects get funded, understanding basics of, of, of design and space and space planning. I mean, so all of those things uh, uh, help the community to, to, to be able to engage in the process and to be able to do it in a, in a meaningful way and, and, and one where they can start to uh, have agency and ownership over the process. And so it's really, really important that we, that we all stay connected, that we get the word out, and that people talk to each other about about what's going on, and put pre and they need to put pressure on uh, their local government to be transparent about what the, about what they're doing, and to always and to say who's in the room. We need to have a seat at this table to talk about this. You know, we're on the ground. We we do know what needs to happen. 
and you just simply need to you need to ask. And so you just got to you've got to just keep uh, fighting that good fight. And 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 again, just asking for transparency and asking them to be at, at the table to help make decisions. Okay. I, I also just wanted to okay. add that. Go ahead. Um, Eddie, you talked about, you know, how do we get this everywhere? And what I value about our team is the respect of local ecosystems. Again, mm -hmm. the, the idea of just, you know, taking this, what we're doing in Atlanta and going there, we understand that every single place has an ecosystem. There is an overarching design of anti-blackness in America, but we also know that every single ecosystem has a way that it works, and, and part of our intention is respecting the local ecosystem so that we can design in a, in a regenerative way. That is so, that's so important. Okay, thank you, Brandy and Shelly from Designing Justice and Designing Spaces for giving us that insight. Uh, and thank you for joining me at The Real News. <laughs>